So that was my little introduction. And here is the picture. You know where this is? Cape Town. This is the, actually the view most of you don't do. You may see, see the Table Mountain right in the back. But this is seen when you just leave Atlantis. Now most of, you know Atlantis? Who's not from South Africa? Okay, you don't know Atlantis. That's where the white people thought we're going to create this big industrial place where we'll have a township and they will be manufacturing all the heavy, dirty stuff for us. And Atlantis is still a center of poverty. It is still a reality, but when you look there, you look at its great beauty. And I'll come back to it. As my background, some of the things that you should know is that I created 12 companies in 12 years and two went bankrupt. Okay? I failed twice. And fortunately for me, the second one failed. Otherwise, I would have been such an arrogant brat. Success creates arrogance. And you need to have a great failure in order to get your feet back into the ground. But what is important is that I work around the world. My organization has 32 offices around the world. We're a foundation. But 32 independent organizations that are supported on one hand by what I call the think tank. It's about 3,000 scientists. And it was originally created to imagine the new business model for the Kyoto Protocol. So we're going back to 1994. And second, we have what we call the do tank. People who are sick and tired of talking and finally want to get their hands dirty and do it. And I tell you, we have too many people thinking and talking and we have way too few people doing. In summary, over the past 20 years, we've implemented 188 projects. We've mobilized 4 billion euro in capital, and we generate 3 million jobs. And we're unhappy because it's not enough. We can do much better. And the only way to do better is to think different. But I'm a father of six. I got five sons. My chromosomes don't seem to be able to make a girl, so I adopted a girl from South Africa. So I'm sorry, from Zimbabwe, Cheeto. We have to think the way our children think. We can't think the way we think. And exactly like Rector Bachman said, you know, I mean, we created the hole in the ozone. We were the hippies. We were the ones who thought we were going to change the world. We've become the biggest consumers in the world. I mean, to be honest, we've goofed up. So, we've got to get a better generation. My right to some kind of fame was this factory. In 1992, just before the first Rio summit, I inaugurated this factory, which is a factory made out of wood. The biggest grass roof ever. This is two football fields of the grass roof. You know why I have the grass roof? Because that's where I was doing my wastewater treatment because I wanted to have a natural water treatment. I didn't want to put it down the sewage. It was my responsibility. We can't do less damage to the environment. We can have no damage. I mean, who accepts doing less bad? Less bad is bad. We've got to do more good. I mean, that's a switch we need. We don't have to protect the environment. We have to put the environment back on its natural evolutionary path. That's what we've got to do. We as humans, we fail in protecting the environment because we behave like elephants. When we turn around, we don't know where our tail is moving. And as a result, we have to stop trying to patronize the, the Earth and trying to create our nature parks and do things slightly different. Now, I tried to do it there, and this factory was making soaps. I went on a head-on collision with Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Henkel, and I took 3% of the market share without advertising because I didn't think we need to brainwash women that you can wash whiter than white. And we still have the same argument 50 years later. It's insane. You're paying 30% of the detergent that you're buying is paying for the advertising that convinced you to buy it in the first place. I mean, how stupid can you get? Is this economics? What is this brainwashing? There's nothing to do with economics. Now, in that factory, I created not only the biodegradable factory, 
the natural uh, treatment of all my waste systems. We had zero waste, zero emissions. And I paid all my workers to come on a bicycle to the factory to work. I paid them half, it translated in money today, it's half a euro a kilometer to ride the bicycle to work. I guarantee you. Even when it rains, people ride a bike. And I had showers installed and people could change. And every worker of mine <coughs> had Patagonia underwear. You know Patagonia? Yeah. All Capelline underwear. So I bought for all my workers Capelline underwear from Patagonia. And then I got a call from Patagonia and said, are you preparing an expedition to the Himalayas? <laughs> and I said, no. I just want my workers to have Capelline underwear so I can turn down the heat in my factory. Because if they're dressed as if they're going to the Himalayas, you know, I don't need to heat up that place. Anyway, what was my frustration? That I created the greatest demand for palm oil. And in 1993, in November, I was in Kalimantan, Indonesia, and I saw the destruction of the rainforest. I saw the destruction of the habitat of the orangutan. And I had to say, I didn't know. I didn't realize. So how can I clean up the rivers in Europe while at the same time I'm destroying the habitat of the orangutan? It's not possible. You can't do good here by doing bad there. Ethically unacceptable. And so most of the people said, well, you'll just change and adapt. And I said, there's no way. There's no way that as long as I didn't know, it was an unintended consequence. But the moment I know, it's collateral damage. Collateral damage is not permitted. We know our military do it all the time. And we know a few nations who are extremely good in creating collateral damage. Extremely good. We don't have to name them. You know them. And they get away with it all the time, even if it's in direct violation of the United Nations Charters. So I said, i got to stop this. i got to create a new logic. I create a logic that we have to dedicate to doing more good. And we have to stop in criticizing the good and the bad. I've lived 27 years in Japan, and therefore my philosophy is everything and everyone can always be better. No one is perfect. We always strive to do better. And don't divide the good and the bad. Don't put yourself in the position of the judge. There is no judges needed for the good and the bad. Some people have different views. In, 19, in 2009, I summarized <coughs> about 15 years of my work in this book called The Blue Economy. And the goal is very simple. I have learned from science hundreds of innovations. So I looked at the best ones. And then I looked at how can we translate these innovations in new business models. We do not need technology. We need new business models. I mean, let's be very honest and in all, in all fairness to this university. This university has a major history in defense industry. Major. We have to look it in the eye. And there's still a lot of mindset here that comes from defense industry. So therefore, the turnaround is going to have to be fundamental. And instead of analyzing the problems, we refuse analyzing problems. We make inventories of opportunities. That's the mindset we have to have. If you want to analyze problems, you can spend decades on analyzing the problem and do nothing about it. Particularly the white European is great in analyzing problems. We created wonderful consultancy companies around it. They go by the names of Accenture and McKinsey. It's a waste of time to analyze and then create boxes of predetermined answers, as if the world is not diverse. So what we need is to be inspired by people. And here you see a few of the people that I always look at who have inspired me. Do you recognize anyone? Tell me. Wangari Matai, of course. And who is she? 
You don't know Wendy Luhabe, South Africans? The creator of Whiphold, the first women investment holding group in the world. That's the largest women investment group quoted on the stock exchange in Joburg. You don't know her? She should be speaking here. You know Whiphold? Whiphold is taken on now the monopoly of cement by doing a joint venture with the Chinese. Because cement in South Africa is double the world market price. Why? Because you got two companies controlling the market for 20 years. And she's creating the new cement industry to break that monopoly that the government has not been willing to look at. Because there's collusion, of course. How is it possible to respond to a building need in South Africa when the cement price is double the world market price? Shame. That's what she says. And so the only way to do it is outcompete on the market and build a new industry. That's Wendy. Hey, she's not bad, huh? I need those. We need those women. Who else do you know? Let me just look. You don't know her? No one from Brazil here? Você de Brasil? No, Peru. Peru. Marina Silva. She's going to be the next president. I hope. I mean, she was Minister of Environment. She's the only one who was able to stop the cutting down of the rainforest. You know this guy, Carlo Petrini. Slow food. Ever heard of slow food? He, he developed slow food. He's from Torino. I'm a professor in Torino. <coughs> Our Japanese friends, Mr. Honda. Honto, ne? Nihonji naramasu ka? Ichi. Oh. Honda-san desu ne? Ah, so desu ka. Well, I can go along right. But you know him? Yeah! He resigned from Apple. You know why? Because he wanted to teach his kids. He said, my role in life is to teach my kids. And he wanted to take a teacher's license in California. You know, he failed. He didn't get the license. Now, we've put a lot of effort on the green economy. Good. I did 30 years. But what's the green economy all about? Unfortunately, the way it worked out is that the green economy, whatever is good for you and good for the environment, is expensive. So it's for the rich. Who made money with what? Not by taking care of the environment. So to me, this is the contradictio. The contradiction is the way the green economy has worked out is not the way we want it. And therefore, the government was subsidizing. I call it blue. Now, if you don't like blue because it doesn't coincide with your political party, call it any color you want. I'm not one of those who puts a trademark on everything and wants to call it me. I don't have that ego problem. Others do have. So what I want to make certain is that we're innovative in the business model, we are competitive. That means we outcompete that old model that is still creating the richer more wealth and the poor more poverty. Let's get out of that logic. And therefore, we need to have, for every initiative, there must be massive job generation. We cannot have the logic of the stock exchange of today for any longer, whereby whenever you lay off 5,000 people, your quotation on the stock exchange goes up. You lay off people, you're rewarded. What kind of a logic is that? And then, of course, you need corporate social responsibility programs to do a bit of window dressing. The big shift is that we have to go from a logic of cutting costs in a globalized economy, we have to go to a logic of generating value in your community. It's the only way you're going to compete because South Africa will never compete on the global market with Chinese salaries or Bangladeshi salaries. Forget about it. I know so many people are brainwashed as MBAs to think that way. So the first thing I do when I initiate a project is kick out all MBAs, except one, me, because <laughs> I have an MBA. Let me... <coughs> be practical. I'm looking at the new business models. New business models means that you need to have a vision. 
You need to know where you want to go to. My vision is very much inspired by nature. Why? First of all, in nature, no one is unemployed. Nice. Wow. Even the young and the old have a job to do. Everyone contributes to their own capabilities. This, to me, is philosophy. Philosophy inspired by nature. It's a nice one. In nature, there's no waste. I mean, we are the only species on Earth capable of making something no one wants. Amazing, huh? And we're the ones who study marketing. And we're the ones that have Philip Kotler. And we're the ones that have Harvard Business School. What's the joke about this? We're the only ones who make something that actually is bad for your health. And we promote it, like nuclear energy. It means you have a little bit of fantasy. But fantasy needs to be translated into reality. And for that, you need and the science and the risk taking. Whenever there is something new, you've got to take the risk. I take my sons every year, once a year, to a place where I have never been, I know no one, and nothing is arranged and planned in advance. And no GPS, no internet. Let's talk to people. There's nothing more powerful than being forced to be humble, get out of your shell, talk to people, and plan on the fly. And if you do that for 10 years in a row, you get flexible kids. Very flexible. Yeah, daddy is around. But. So, anything we do, and I'm going to the philosophy of the blue economy, has multiple benefits. What's the use of these lamps? What kind of lamps are that? LED lamps. What else do these lamps do? They're giving you light, and they're giving you internet. I mean, I don't know engineering, but I have studied a bit of physics. And I have learned that the speed of light is faster than the speed of sound. You agree? We learned that as well. So why do we base internet on the radio wave? I mean, who was so stupid? Why didn't you take a light wave? So you have internet at the speed of light instead of internet at the speed of sound. And we call it broadband. Joke. Fool ourselves. So, these lights are available today. They give you internet and light at the same time. And they give you internet, broadband, at the speed of light. That means that if you're in Stellenbosch, or if you're in a township, you could put up a public light pole, and you shine the light. And at the same time, you're getting Wi-Fi. No, what, not Wi-Fi. It's called Li-Fi. Light-based internet. No research in the whole of South Africa on this. Because South Africa is wasting its money on providing internet, like so many other countries do, by just buying stuff from Cisco. Cisco is a dinosaur. But we don't see it. Why? Because we only have information on the internet. And Cisco is quite happy to preserve its cash flow by everyone wanting to have their own router. You see the picture? I'm the rebel. I don't take it. Second principle, use what you have. It's extremely important. Instead of imagining all what you can get from anywhere in the world, you use what you have. Now, gentlemen, let's talk about this. Ladies, you're excused for a moment. Now, this is the place where gentlemen go hopefully twice a day. If not, they're sick. Problems with the kidneys. Now, what is the problem with this? It consumes massive amounts of drinking water. I mean, have you ever thought about it that 30% of the consumption of water in Cape Town is for flushing toilets? 30%. It's insane. It was never designed for having drinking water. And still we do it. We know it, we don't talk about it. So, here are the urinals. Now, there was a small Swiss company that developed uh, some little chemical with a tap over it and says you don't use water anymore. We use save water. What they don't say is that now you pay double the amount of money for the water in chemicals imported from Switzerland and a service. Now, this is the green economy. Okay, you pay more and you save water any import from Switzerland. We have a very simple solution. 
You know what this is made of? An old pinched bicycle inner tube. You just have a heat press with a mold. <coughs> and when you do your job in there, it goes through. And the physics of the inner tube is very simple. When it's pressed like that, no odor comes through. The slightest pressure of a liquid, it opens up. No more liquid, closes up. What do we do? We recycle old, old inner tubes from bicycles, we eliminate the chemicals, and we eliminate the water. That is what I call use what you have. Sometimes it is so simple, it's embarrassing. We love highly complex and expensive technical solutions from which we can take patents and claim ownership so we can save the world and make a fortune. Now, we call what comes out of this urinal a high concentration of potassium. We don't call it P. If you call it P, no one is interested. You call it potassium, people are interested. I mean, I did study marketing. It all depends on what you give as a name. We reuse inner tubes, we have more value and a lower cost. The only way we're going to make sustainability work is that it is cheaper and better. Simple as that. So we have to generate value instead of generating and cutting costs. <coughs> this is an insult to the solar energy engineers. Let me explain you. A solar panel made of crystalline selenium gets the sun. If there's too much sun and the panel gets too hot, it decreases in efficiency. That's why we don't use the top and the bottom of the panel, because it will get way too hot. So what have we done 100 years ago with our cars? When the car engine gets too hot, what do we do? Cool it with what? With water. So here you have a sandwich of PV, and inside you have eight capillary pipes with water. And what do the engineers of solar energy tell us? Professor Pauli, you should know that too much consumption of silicium, your material cost will be too high. Bullshit, you guys! I'm not talking about making it more expensive, I'm talking about generating more value. What is happening? First of all, I can use the both sides of the panel. I increase my efficiency. With, <coughs> with only one-third of the panel, I generate five times more energy. How? Well, first of all, you generate electricity. But since you have normal energy on the top, concentrated solar on the bottom, and you control the temperature in the panel, always at 50 degrees Celsius, the maximum efficiency, you have more electricity. Second, now you have hot water. And now comes the best. Do solar panels work at night? Of course they work at night. Because when you have a black panel, what happens? It heats, the radiates out the heat. So what do you get? Your water pipes now have cold water, 6 degrees Celsius. What can you do with 6 degrees Celsius? So at night, thanks to your solar panel, you get 6 degrees cold water, and during the day, you can boost your water up to 120 degrees, and you have electricity. Now, here you see a picture of Sweden. Anyone from Sweden here? Hey, how are you? Ja, känna. Och du så komska? Skåna. Ja, nu hör det det. Ja, hör det. Ja. So, this is uh, 170 kilometers north of Stockholm in November. And we're having district heating, hot water and electricity in November in Sweden. Now, may I humbly submit to you, if it works in Sweden, do you think it would work in South Africa? I mean, do you really need to go and do a technology audit now? Do you really have to do a business plan? Why don't you get your act together and get it installed and move on? Because what is happening is that, and yeah, the first production will be here in South Africa as well. You get heat, you get cooling and electricity. Three functions. 
Then, since you have an airspace to allow the mirror to get to the bottom in concentrated power, it's an insulation. But, since you have a thick structure and not that ultra-thin Chinese cheap structure, with all due respect to my Chinese friends, it is your roof. You don't put it on the roof, it is your roof. Now you can keep the water not at 55 degrees Celsius, as the geysers in South Africa do, which is actually promoting the growth of bacteria. And that's the reason why in the summertime in South Africa, 70% of the kids have gastrointestinal diseases, also amongst the rich. Because your geysers are geared to saving ESCOM from too much demand for electricity. The temperature should be at least at 68 to 70 degrees if you really want to eliminate the salmonella. And we don't do it. Because if you do that for the whole of South Africa, you have blackouts. So there is a collusion of interest. So in order to save energy, you just get people sick. I don't get it. I thought the purpose was to serve the people. I didn't think the purpose was to save the neck of an electric company. We get to say sometimes these things. That's why sometimes they're not so popular. Now, if you have water at 95 degrees or 120 degrees, it becomes your energy storage. You don't have to buy a battery because you don't take your shower at 120 degrees. You take your shower at 40, 38. Now, between 120 and 40, that differential generates electricity. Those systems work. They're installed not in South Africa yet. So I've committed to get the factory going here. Now, the black you see is all recycled plastics, which today South Africa exports pelleted to China for $150 a ton. $100 for the middlemen, $50 for the poor people who do scavenging. This is the reality of the economy. We've got to say the way it is. We've got to look these realities in the eye. And we generate local production. This is the new business model. Use what you have. Change the rules of the game. It's my favorite. We have to change the rules of the game. You have to put it in your mind. That's why, you know, as a professor, I'm a professor at three universities. I'm very much uh, debated by my fellow professors because I have a very simple exam system. I've always, oh, there are only three questions in the exam. But you know what kind of questions? The students ask me questions. I'm bored listening to students telling me what I know. I don't want to hear that. I want them to figure out what I do not know. So if my students have three questions and I have one question I cannot answer, they get the maximum points. And I tell you, my students do take great effort to figure out what does he not know. Where can we get him? There are even websites on that. <laughs> you know the great thing about it is? In order to figure out what I do not know, you've got to know what I know. And if you're that good, then you should get maximum points. My fellow professors don't agree. <coughs> the change of the rules I want, and we're working on today, is alternate current. You know alternate current? Alternate current was designed to be able to distribute electricity over long distance. It is inefficient, but if you have the power to control the nation and you want to put the cables, that's where you make your cash. That is where you make gold coming out of these cables. So, I like direct current. Direct current is not designed to go over long distance. It's designed to go local. Any one of you played with little Trains, electric trains, yeah, okay. Little electric trains, direct current. It works perfectly because it's all local. So, everyone who played with electric trains is an expert in direct current. <coughs> and you learn it at the age of 8, 10, 12. Wonderful age, you never forget life. Now the beauty what we have forgotten is that when you have an electric current, direct current, then you have the plus and the minus. You remember, you got to connect the two cables to make electricity. If you don't do that, it doesn't work. <coughs> that means you only have electricity where the plus and the minus meet. 
Great. What's the result? The result is that there is no more the result is that there is no more piracy possible. With AC, you can just take a cable and you have electricity. With DC, you find the cable, get nothing. Only when it crosses. That means you eliminate piracy. How much electricity is lost in South Africa due to piracy? Too much. So, you eliminate piracy, but as the previous slide showed, on top of that, 80% of what we should be using at home is DC-based. Everything that you have that is electronic is DC-based. Your cell phone, your security system, your, uh, even your plasma television, your light systems, everything is DC-based. Except your, your deep freezer and your water cooker or your, for the Japanese, your rice cooker. Your rice cookers, uh, you know, they are not DC-based. But everything else is DC-based. So what do we do? We transport electricity over long distances, and then we have to invert it to low voltages. And if you have solar energy, the first thing you did is create the solar energy, and then you have to transform it from 12 volt to 220. And then when it comes to your home, you do it again. Excuse us, gentlemen. Who are we supporting? Doesn't make any sense. So therefore, no piracy, no risk of electrocution, cheaper, longer life. You know, when you have an AC, your machines must be very carefully calibrated. Any change ruins your system. That's why some people have to buy additional stabilizers for their net, for the grid. With a DC, you don't need that. Eliminate it. Because you can take between... 12 and 10 volt, those changes don't make any difference. But it does make a big difference if you're working at AC. And now you create new industries because you've simplified. We're working today with Mitsubishi, with Toshiba, with Siemens, with Philips. And we're re-engineering their machines so everything runs directly on DC. Everything. And you know what? You save 60% energy just by changing the system. Change rules the game. Reinvigorate agriculture and industry. It is critical. I disagree with the logic that we first were the poor people and the agricultural society, then we were developing in an industrial society, then we got to the service industries and we're developing, and now we're the knowledge people. Now we got knowledge. And who's going to feed us? Are you all happy with the GMO you get from America today? South Africa has gone completely GMO, huh? Everything is GMO here. Why? Oh, we need to make it drought resistant. No, 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 no. You need to plant something that grows what you have. Why do you want to plant only five crops in the whole world? Of course, if you want to force these five crops in the whole world, you're going to have to develop seeds that are resistant to drought. The only, few, only time in history that farmers are not permitted to keep their seeds is this present day. I mean, this has never happened in history, that we have contractual agreements endorsed by a government, including the South African government, of course the American government as well, that we endorse the fact that farmers cannot keep seeds from the harvest. This is absolutely ridiculous. And we tolerate it because we don't protest anymore. So here is one of the initiatives I've taken. I'm the chairman of this company. What is this petrochemical facility? Where? Sardinia. Italiano. Anyone from Italy here? No? Okay. Well, too bad. This is the old petrochemical facility of ENI, ENI, the eighth largest petrol group in the world. It went bankrupt. Why? Because NAFTA is too expensive. NAFTA in Europe and in South Africa is at a cost of approximately $800 a ton. You can buy it in Saudi Arabia, if you're Saudi Arabian, for 140. See the difference? So this went bankrupt. We took it over. What did we do? Well, we created the new industry based on bi-based. Bi-based industries. We created the first and the largest biorefinery in the world. And this is our raw material. What is it called in English? 
a thistle. I mean, thistles? Yeah, we use thistles. Because the European Union has been funding farmers in Sardinia, 70,000 hectares of farmland, and they finance them not to farm. I mean, you can get stupid, but sometimes you can get very stupid. Now, what do you get when for 20 years you don't farm your farmland? You get weeds. So what do we do? We harvest them. We harvest the weeds, the flowers and the stems and the roots. We harvest them and we turn it into six chemicals. Chemicals to make plastics, chemicals to make mulching, chemicals to have your espresso pots or your tea filters. We make it as herbicides because Thistles are very strong in outcrowding everything else, so that means they have their own herbicides, the natural ones. <coughs> we have elastomers to make rubber more flexible, and we're using lubricants, lubrification agents. You can use it from engines to condoms. It's a huge market. Now, we get six cash flows out of a thistle. And the leftover is feed for animals. 20% is left over and we give it as feed to the animals because it still has a lot of nutrition. Now we can give the feed at $250 a ton, whereas when you buy it in Brazil, you pay $500 for soy. So what do we have as a result? By taking over the old petrochemical plant, we're regenerating with the weeds on the fields, we're generating six chemicals and two extra products, feed, and then you have cheese. Well, we don't make the cheese. But when we were starting with a the project, there was this uh, two old ladies who came to our project office and they said, you know, on the flower of the thistle, there's this dust. Could you give us some of that dust? I said, well, how much do you want? They said, well, 100 grams is fine. <laughs> so we went back and calculated and we realize we can have 2,000 tons of it. And then, of course, we wondered, and what do you use it for? Oh, that is how we used to make cheese. These are the bacterial enzymes on the flowers that we used to, for the cheese making. Now, we didn't realize that if you have 2,000 tons of these uh, en bacterial enzymes from your flowers, you become the biggest producer of enzymes for cheese in Europe. We didn't know. Now, the beauty is that once you get into this, you get into a complete new logic. Out of a weed, we're generating $3,700 per ton. Now, in South Africa and in America and a few other countries, they think in order to compete on the world market, they need shale gas. Bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. You don't need shale gas. You need to not have energy cheaper. You need to have higher revenues from what you have. I mean, who pumped that into the brains of people that it has to be cheap? And cheaper is cheaper. Cheaper is not generating any jobs. The couple hundred jobs it would ever generate in South Africa is never going to resolve anything. But do you have some waste streams from agriculture in South Africa? What about your grapes? What do you do with your skins? At best, it's composted. At best. You know what we do in Mexico with all that waste? I mean, we, got so, we have uh, so many projects. In Mexico, we use all the seed waste from grapes and from avocados to dry and crush it, and we make it as an additive for bread. And as a result, we can offer bread 20% cheaper and at the same time fortified with all the minerals and all the vitamins. That is blue economy. It is not getting cheaper bread because you have genetically modified your wheat. That's not the way forward. That is the way it serves 500 corporations in the world. It's not the way we're going to hang out in this world and stamp out poverty. This is the change we need. So, we need multiple cash flows, and here comes my favorite fro project on a little island in the Caribbean. 30,000 goats. Now, when there are 30,000 goats, what do you think happens? They eat everything. Now, when the goats eat everything, what happens to the soil? 
the topsoil, which to me is the skin of the earth, is eaten away. Now, when the topsoil blows away, what happens to your sea? It gets murky. And when you have a murky sea, who dies? Everything. So, we needed to find some feed for the goats. We found salicornia. Salicornia is a salt resistant. You have it on the coast here as well. You go to the coast, you have salicornia. Zeekrau, I think in Afrikaans. At least in Dutch, that's the word we use. Mangroves, we replant mangroves, and mangroves need to be cut like grass. You cut the tops of the mangroves off, you blend it with your salicornia, you get great feed for your sheep and your goats. And if you cut the mangroves on the top, the roots grow faster. That's what you need as a mangrove, because then they're tsunami resistant. Then they're climate change resistant. So, now we get goat milk. And locally, we have not only the goats and the goat milk, locally we also have aloe vera. So we make, well, we make ice cream. Delicious, creamy, 100% goat's milk ice cream with aloe vera. <coughs> and we change the business model. Normally a farmer would get 60 cents a liter for the milk. Who survives on that? So what we do now is the farmer gets 10% of the sales price of the ice cream. That means he gets $7 per liter. What do you think when the farmer, what, think, what do you think happens when the farmer gets $7 a liter for goat's milk? He kisses every goat before she goes to bed. <laughs> I guarantee you. He's going to give all loving care. And not one goat is going to run around anymore. All the goats are in sight. And what did we do? The only thing we did is change the business model. Instead of an extractive approach to the farmer, where you press down the price by some corporation, we say, we give you 10% of the sales price. And then you realize how much money is made with ice cream then you realize how we have not appreciated the farmers. Now, if you pay $7, what do you get? Great quality ice cream, great quality milk, full care of the animals. I mean, animal care is going to be lifted to a different level. And the farmers will finally live with an income that their kids can see as a future. So, now we can tackle the corals. Because if you didn't tackle the problem of the... Soil erosion, you can't tackle the corals. So we've initiated a program called the Regeneration of the Coral Forests. We're planting 100 million corals on one island. What is the reaction of any sensible person when he hears that? You're nuts. How much did it cost? 500 million euro. 500 million euro for a population of 17,500? Not financeable. I tell people who have that kind of an attitude to always please leave the room. Because, you know, if you're against something, at least don't be in the way of the people who want to do it. I mean, get out of the way. Get out of the room. So how do we do it? First of all, we created a paddy course. Who has paddy? So professional divers, you got the course. Now you can go and take a one and a half day course on how to plant corals. We need to learn. It needs to be part of our learning. You plant a coral. Second, we create coral nurseries. In order to have coral nurseries, we recycle the old TV antennas. We don't want anything new. Old TV, we all went for these new antennas for DSTV, and so the old antennas are gone. Well, we recycle them, we hang them in the sea, and here is how it works. Very simple. Little coral, big coral, provided there is a good flow of nutrients to the coral. You plant it, it grows. This is three years afterwards. So what do we do? The coral nursery, each one of these antennas generates 600 corals every six months. We create the coral nursery with 100 or 200 of those. And then we made a deal with Tui, who's from Germany. Tui, Sekenia Tui, so famous. So Tui created a special trip to this island to plant corals fully booked. We don't have enough corals. What a nice problem. 
we sell the corals for five euro a piece, our 500 million budget, done deal. And what happens? If you have spent two weeks planting corals, do you think you would have the desire to go back and have a look? Yeah, you all want to go back. So you get repeat tourism because you're emotionally linked to finding and working for a solution. The biggest job generation that we have on the island is coral nurseries. Now, you can't look, go to university and say, I want to, be a, I want to do a PhD in coral nurseries. But we do have a policy and an interest to plant trees on the land, but we forget that 70% of this earth is the sea. And you've got to repopulate the vegetation of the sea as well. Because you've got the repopulation of the sea with corals, you've got the fish and the animals, and everyone else coming along with it. Okay. Now, I warn you, you got to stop me when it's time to stop because I don't stop. <laughs> My introduction is two weeks. Okay? No, I don't know. So you better raise your hand and say, Gunter, stop. Coffee, my favorite. Who had a cup of coffee this morning? Okay. Who thought about the waste that you left behind by drinking that cup of coffee? Because when you drink a cup of coffee, you're only consuming 0.2% of the bean. 99.8% is left behind. And you do nothing with it. Well, what do we do? Now, this is 20 years of experience, and this is one of the biggest job generators we have. First of all, you grow mushrooms on it. We have 1,500 companies established doing mushrooms and coffee wastes. You can start tomorrow. You don't have to think about it. It's been done. Second, when you have the waste from the coffee after you harvest the mushrooms, you have chicken feed. If you're living in the city, give it to your dog. The dog learns to eat it when a puppy, it will eat it for the rest of his life. Don't buy Purina, por favor. Then we blend coffee 8% into the textiles for your clothing. Patagonia is one of our clients. Why? Because coffee absorbs odor. So you go out and do some sports, you come back, no odor. Wow, instead of pss, 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 yeah. Eliminate those metal oxides that are carcinogens that block your pores and make you unhealthy. Just stop using that, just shift to clothing that absorbs it. We now put it in carpets with DESO and interface. We put it into insulation material for refrigerators and cars and we put it in paints. What is the end result? Coffee farmers are earning four times more when they're associated in the complete value chain. They don't care about the global market for coffee. The price on the world market is irrelevant. It's irrelevant because you make money on the paint, on the carpet, on the clothing, on the mushroom. You make money on all of that. That is how the economy should be structured. It's the only way. Or would you like to continue to cut your costs on the farm and automate your farm so you can compete against Vietnam? I mean, this is the proposal that all economists are being taught. When my daughter, here's Chido, is working in Chipinge in Zimbabwe with women working on coffee farms, and she tells them with the waste of the farm, you can have food security and you can feed your chickens. You know what these women do? They get up, they sing, they dance, and they do it. <laughs> Fantastic. This is Africa. Africa is amazing. People get it. What do we need? Feasibility studies. Technology audits. I mean, we kill the initiative by forcing people to sit in front of a computer and do Excel spreadsheets. You know nothing about the business. Time. Okay. <coughs> Timberland is using it. Look at their slogan. Drink it, wear it. Drink your coffee, put it in your shoes. Now, I'm going to skip a few things, but I have to tell you at least this example. Well, this one as well. Sorry. Just to... I'll be ready very quickly. Let's go back to Cape Town. 
This is 36 square kilometers of land that has just been approved to become part of Cape Town to do a new real estate development. I mean, the amazing thing is the business of real estate is to get land, to use your political friendship, to get it converted into, from farmland into real estate land, and you make a killing. You make a billion rand in a couple of years' time. And then you get out, and you do it again. So, what I've proposed, and what's been agreed, <coughs> is Cape Town has a backlog of 380,000 homes. 380,000 families are waiting to be able to get a home. Delivery is not happening, for reasons we know. But building a home is not the solution. You have to build a community. Community is the basis. And community means you get water, you get energy, you get health, you get education, you get jobs. So this is the problem around Cape Town. I will not go through it. But I'll show you the middle. Basically, any development that is happening today in Cape Town, or for that sake across Africa, it, the money gets out of the community. That means the people have to go out of the community to earn money, and when they get home, the money goes out again. The poverty trap. The poverty trap is money doesn't stay in Soweto, it doesn't stay in Kalicha, it doesn't stay in Philippi. It always goes out again. And therefore, there is no future. So what we design is an economic system for this development project where the money stays local. We can talk a little later about how you do that. But the money keeps on circulating. Now, the money keeps on circulating. You grow that economy. You lift people out of poverty. And we've done it before. So we increase the cash flow. We generate multiplier effects. And we improve the purchasing power. But we reduce the risk. If people have more purchase power, because the money circulates locally, then you reduce risk. If you do reduce risk, then you have financing. So we first install the energy, secure the water. 90% of all the food consumed in these 36 square kilometers comes from the 36 square kilometers. It's the only way to go. The moment you get more than 50% out of your community, poverty forever. So we know that as economists. Finally, the most important case. This is the Vals. I'm sorry you are from outside of South Africa. You got to see this. This is the result of 100 years of mining. This is where we secure that asthma will be around forever. Because we have fine dust that goes around from the gold mines and people don't take responsibility. Sorry. So I engage with Mark Kutifani. I engage with Venkat. I engage with the president of these mining companies. And I say, Hey, you guys, let's change the business model. Because this way is no way. I think that the next generation will put these CEOs in jail for knowingly creating asthma for years to come. So let's change the business model. So we use all this waste from the mines. Uh, I'll go quickly through that. We use the waste of the mines to create paper. We've revolutionized the paper making. I don't think it makes sense to have a genetically modified eucalyptus or pine tree that sucks all the water out of the ground, that depletes the topsoil in order to make paper. And on top of that, the major South African companies like Mondi and Sapi have long left South Africa. They're global players. As a result, South Africa is a net importer of paper and pulp. South Africa imports. Now, we make stone paper. South Africa can become the world's second largest producer of stone paper after China. China has the basis. Now, this is the factory in China. The first factory was set up in Shenyang, in China. We're on to producing one million tons of paper made from stones, crushed stones from mines. Now, that's a new business model. And here you see the pipeline. Instead of having a tailing dam where you dump all your waste, the pipeline with the sand, crushed leftovers from the beneficiation of your ore, 
goes straight into a paper factory. That's a different business model. Any country that has no water but a lot of rocks, you can make your paper. Because we make paper without water, magazine paper, even ExxonMobil uses all its paper now. And guess what? This is Chinese wine packaged in stone paper, cardboard. I think there are some wineries around here who could, uh, instead of using imported uh, fine paper from Europe, depleting your balance of payments, could be invigorating the mining industry by creating stone paper out of the waste. Mines give you paper. We have six revenues. The reason why I can be here today is because yesterday I was at the Reserve Bank. I was invited by the Governor Jill Marcus to present to a hundred leaders in the South African industry and banking and policy making on what are the new business models. I can tell you, they flip when they hear about stone paper. But South Africa has about 800 million tons of waste dust from mining. That's enough to supply two years the world with stone paper. And the beauty of it is it's recyclable forever, forever. So, to conclude, we only teach our children what we know, they can never do better than us. We gotta create a great freedom to do other things. So as a result, every project that I develop, our teams implement, is translated into a children's story, into a fable. Everything. Today I have 190 fables, so I have an agreement with the Chinese government to do 365. They'll be on TV every day, instead of Disney. Now, the Chinese like the idea of not having Disney. <laughs> We're teaching the Chinese why the zebra has black and white stripes. We're sharing with the Chinese how the whale is capable of pumping a thousand liters of blood through 175 million kilometers of veins and arteries with six volts of electricity and it has no connection to the grid and no battery. So please explain me how does it work. We need to inspire kids. Here is my launch in China this year, 5,000 schools, 10 million kids is a pilot project for us. We're aiming to go for 300 million kids by end of next year. We need to do something very simple. We need, first of all, to set clear targets. Second, we define strategies of how to do it. And third, we need to inspire children. You don't inspire children, you're getting nowhere. Nowhere. The world is gonna change because, not because the projects I do, it's because the children we inspire. With the wisdom of Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you. <laughs>